the tip. That's us today. An honor to be sure. One we have long attempted to gain. Long. It was that night. That one event over four years ago. It haunted us. Followed us like a shadow. Because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Oh no. Not Ulick. Our dear sergeant. Our albatross. None of us believed in luck or curses. That stupidity was for a distant past, where humanity lived in caves and worshipped the sun as it greeted them each morning. He wasn't bad luck. He was hated. Hated, I tell you. Not just by us. Well, we did also love him. He was ours, our brother, our sergeant. But we had to live with him. And those that did not? Well, he was an acquired taste, to put it mildly. Sorry. Defending him again, old habits, even in my own reverie. I make excuses for him. But no, he wasn't an acquired taste. He was unlikable in the extreme. Bullish and blunt like most marines. We do not stand a performance, just utility. But even so, he was bellicose and truculent. He would not hold his tongue. Ever. As he always put it, They can listen or they can fail. It's up to them. But either way, my duty is discharged. I'll do as instructed, but they'll get my opinion before I go. And he meant it. Every word. I think, if he were less effective, it wouldn't have been so bad. Perhaps, if he just didn't show them all up so much, he would already have been a praetor or consul. But no, he was blunt. To a point far beyond rudeness, even for an Astartes. And each time he was proven right, which was often... He would not hold back. Never let sleeping grocks lie. A most didn't like that. Most. He said he had an expectation of competence. An assumption it should be present in any he served with. Anyone. And his standards were the highest in the expedition. We, his squad, truly were the best. We had to be. He'd destroy anyone, anything less than exceptional, if I am honest. We followed him despite his personality, because that old cuss got us through every single time. Which didn't help either. He had the least casualties in combat, most outside of it, as he weeded out new recruits. But he got us through. He didn't care, not about us, just the effective running of the squad and its honour. Our banners should have been heaving with awards, commendations, rewards for excellence. But he made it impossible. The spectacles were nothing to him. The reward only counted. And even here, he was churlish. Stated loudly things like, Finally! About time! Or even, So, force you to it then! At the decorating officers. Yet... We were the best. In a collection of the best warriors humanity had ever produced. So he stayed as he was. Never promoted. Too useful to discard. And he was our leader. But also our burden. None would transfer. The legions were not like that. But none of us would ever be noticed. When Cadmus took the eye of a greater Xenos tyrant in a single combat, it was not noticed. When I shot the eye of the pilot of a fleeing Psyker's barge, bringing it and him down into a fiery death, it was not commented on. When Regulus charged a bunker and single-handed cleared it while we held perimeter against a swarm, noted only. We were his, alone, 
for no other squad wished they be tarred with association with us. It was lonely, but we had each other, so we trained together endlessly, with the best oiled unit in our expedition. Some veteran squads had less experience and reaction time than us. Most had less service time combined. Four years ago, he did it. He finally went too far and made it all this bad or worse. The Primarch, his guard. Why could he not have just done as everyone else did? Why could he not obey? Show some decorum. Show some damn respect. We were aghast when it happened. They were never more than 49 paces from him. From our lord, our master, the Pale King, Mortarion. We rounded a corner, and there one was. One of his bodyguards. He stood outside of a door, ignoring us. And then the sergeant said it. Slamming it down here near the actual fighting today. Over his shoulder. He smirked at his quip as he went. But it was noted. That was the day it got worse. Became as it was. Guard duty. Garrison. Sweeping forests. Baggage duty. More guard detail. In one sentence, he had robbed us of any chance of rising with him. His career was over. And so was ours. Or so we thought. We were often linked near destroyer units, supporting or punching through so they could do their nasty deeds, unpleasant in the extreme. We were as unpopular as they. But today, today we are washed clean. Today, we are signalled as forgiven. For today, we have the spear tip. Now our many, many detractors do not know it yet. They scoff behind closed doors, eyes twinkling as they say us in the mess. Ha, <laughs> smirks and nudges. Because they think this is a death sentence. I hope far more forlorn than even breaches, because this one is going to be nasty. But they underestimate us. They overestimate the enemy. And when this is done, when we face them all at battle's end, they won't be able to stop us. They won't be able to ignore or belittle or deplore us. They'll be forced to give credit. They'll be forced to give us the bump. They'll be forced to cover us in glory. So today, today we are going to fight like mad dogs, like monsters, like dusk raiders. We march out of our camps and swiftly erected bastions in our thousands. We do not take transports. The storm is coming. So we march. Our army arrives at the outskirts of their last city as it hits. They were mustering, preparing to attack us. They had tasted our air support too often and too bitterly to ignore this advantage when the odds would, in their minds, be more even. We have the tip. We are the first in. At the front of thousands of our kind, scores of our starties in blocks of units stride beside and behind us. The storm comes in over their city and into our faces. Our visuals are practically useless, or so the enemy believe. We switch our senses and see their seemingly endless mustering heat before us. They believe we are blind. For what could see through the sandstorm, but they, the children of the storm. We see them advance. They are clever, clever Xenos. Huge. They do not charge. So many are they that we would hear that. Even over the storm? No. They advance in a strange slide. With their feet, they do not raise them, but allow the storm to almost propel them along the ground mildly bouncing up at times to be forced forward if needed. But a wall of them hundreds deep advance, but scattered. This will be their last battle. 
We advance slowly but steadily at the front. We have one job, and we will do it. And the rest of the units on either side or behind us maintain their slow trudge. We move. The sergeant just snorts down the comms at the units behind us, the destroyers. Then he snaps his last order, the only one he has to give us. Sigma pattern advance! And we know. It's our time now. We are in two lines of ten as we advance, not walking, but running, our strides eating the ground between us and the hordes. We fire a blisting fusillade into them, rank after rank of the large pallid Goliaths fall. A twelve foot apiece they are, but their limbs blow off and their heads explode under bolter fire. We unload as fast as we can, chewing through our clips at an unprecedented pace. As we move forward, we judge by clip changes. By the third, we have closed in. We are now three ranks as the grenades are launched from our squad. More of the enemy die as we close the last yards. Our chain bayonets are ripped into a deafening roar only seconds before we hit them, while the rest of the army marches out of the storm and into them, slaughtering them with volley after volley. We are leagues ahead and amongst them. Strangely, their powerful bows are more effective at piercing our warplate than their bronzed weapons. Despite their size, they are not even as strong as we are in our power armor. Their blades shatter or bend on our warplate. We can still be killed by direct blows by their malleted royal guard. War hammers so heavy they can barely wield them. They do not hit often. But if they hit dead on, <laughs> dead is the word. But we are better. Our sergeant has drilled us so we can perform these actions blindfold. We dance around the huge lumps and bowl them over and tear them to pieces. Why do I mention the Royal Guard? <laughs> because, before we know it, we can see them. And they are charging us. People think a battle is one thing. It is. And it is not. For us, it was a succession of incredibly brief duels. For these Xenos had cultural mores against physical contact. Hence, even in war, their densest formations were a good pace apart. They were large, but they were slow. And they were spread out. So we butchered them. If they just locked on and charged as one, they would have literally trampled us. But their gods forbade it. So we killed them. Perhaps they had come from a period of ease. There seemed to be zero dangerous flora or fauna on this planet. None. Perhaps once upon a time, these were a mighty warrior race that had exterminated everything of threat on the whole world. They had made a paradise, but they had become soft. Or perhaps they had always been harmless, gentle giants that simply never had to strive to fight for their very existence. We were not avenging angels. We were not soldiers righting a wrong. They'd done nothing to us. We were the march of inevitability and they were in our way. Desperation leads to extremes, and across the battlefield the Xenos now charge. Their slow spread advance killed so many of them that they made no progress against our bolters. Always pushed back. But now they erupt into a final wail. A single scream is torn from their lungs as one. The death scream of a race. And they charge across the whole lines. Knowing so many will die, they forget all and do the unwanted. They begin to bunch, and the main thrust falters. Bolters are drowned out by the chain blades, now running in their thousands behind us. But they are behind us. We are the spear tip, but one that has outpaced the leaf and the shaft. We see their line troopers break before us, as Sarge tears the head off two enemies and then goes on to tear the guts out of another. He is in his element up close. 
we all are. He barks a grunt and we finish ours off viscerally to intimidate. Then we form up and begin to fire, but we do so carefully. The Royal Guard. They have shields that stop bolters half of the time, so we head and knee shot them. It's going to get nasty if they hit us. But it's then that he, our sergeant, snaps another grunt. We break into two groups, like the parting of a sea, fluidly and efficiently, always maintaining precision fire, even in the storm. And they are here. The destroyers are about to introduce themselves to the Royal Guard. Desperation leads to extremes, and across the battlefield the Xenos now charge. Their slow spread advance killed so many of them that they made no progress against our bolters. Always pushed back. But now they erupt into a final wail. A single scream is torn from their lungs as one. The death scream of a race. And they charge across the whole lines. Knowing so many will die, they forget all and do the unwanted. They begin to bunch and the main thrust falters. Bolters are drowned out by the chain blades now running in their thousands behind us. But they are behind us. We are the spear tip, but one that has outpaced the leaf and the shaft. We see their line troopers break before us as Sarge tears the head off two enemies and then goes on to tear the guts out of another. He is in his element up close. <laughs> we all are. He barks a grunt and we finish ours off viscerally to intimidate. Then we form up and begin to fire, but we do so carefully. The Royal Guard. They have shields that stop bolters half of the time, so we head and knee shot them. It's going to get nasty if they hit us. But it's then that he, our sergeant, snaps another grunt. We break into two groups, like the parting of a sea, fluidly and efficiently, always maintaining precision fire, even in the storm. And they are here. The destroyers are about to introduce themselves to the Royal Guard. We maintain our fire, gunning down as many of the flanking forces as possible, shooting out their legs, their heads, as the destroyers charge into them. The ten-man strong unit has so many ways to slaughter as we watch these maniacs go to work. The first few of the Royal Guard charge forward confidently, but their folly is realized swiftly. Four blasts come out of the squad as it charges forward, Lines of power that strike the shields of the Xenos, but their metallic projections just seem to turn to dust, as the beam then strikes their bodies, and in seconds it is like they simply disappear from the point that they are struck. Like a wave of unmaking, they are disintegrated. This unnerves many of them, but they still move forward. The destroyers now hit them in earnest. Power swords carve through shields, legs, spine, sinew. Power fists knock them back as one into lines of their allies. All crushed by the impact, blood exploding from them, leaving trenches of slickness below and around their flight path. Yet our bolters are not saying enough of them. The sides are taking real pressure, and there are few of them. Ulick stabs his bolter into the air and tears into action his chain blade. We all follow suit. He does not even have to give the order, as we all charge. The destroyers are killing them so fast they are marching forward. We on their flanks, now ripping and tearing as we did before. The ground is awash with severed limbs toppled giants. The flailing finished off by our chain blades attached to our bolters. And then it happens. The moment. Ulrich had always trained us always told us, each little party 
had its high point, and this was it. The Royal Guard were being pushed back, but they had dragged the destroyers out of cohesion. Even with our support, the center had gone, as a massive Xenos with blackened armor tore into the front. It had not one, but two of these huge mallets that could crush a marine in one direct hit. It was a hero of some form. Then we saw it for what it was, their king, and Ulrich filled the gap. The king swung down at him, and the sergeant just ducked and stepped back, the thing coming after him. But the king was livid, knowing this its last battle, and rose both hammers over its head to crush down on Ulrich as one. Yet as they came down, Ulrich spun on his heels and almost pirouetted, as he then swung a thunderous backhand strike on its leg in exactly the right spot. It broke backwards on itself, and the Xenos King fell forward. Ulrich was on it in a flash, and it barely looked up at him as he brought down his chain blade, decapitating it messily. The remains of the Royal Guard all howled as one and turned to flee. Ulrich then strode to the severed head and beckoned over four unengaged men now that the enemy had fled. He made them form a square, a support from their bolters, and rose him up as he stood on them. From his elevated position, Ulrich held up the head of the dead king. The storm calming, the airs clearing, the sight of their king humbled, the panic went down the line. And as the Xenos broke, the other destroyer units across the entire battlefield went into them with a greater zeal. Charnabal blades sliced, chainswords ripped, rad grenades exploded amongst the Xenos. It became an utter slaughter, one that went on through the dawn and onwards. Only at the very end of the day did the destroyer squads return. The rest of the tactical units, such as ours, forming a perimeter around their last city, and gunning down any who made it out, attempting to flee. And they, the destroyers, they killed them all. In less than a day, they killed them all. Yet it was not the end of the events, for when we got topside again, well, We had arrived back on the ship. As always, we had been delayed. Practically the last to leave. But this time, it was for a reason. When the doors to the shuttle opened, we were accosted by the sight of a hangar that was utterly packed. Line upon line of our chapter were there, perhaps most of them. And as we left the transport, we could all see him surrounded by his honor guard. Our lord, our master, he was a, the Pale King, Mortarian. Ulrich took off his helm, raised his chin, and walked straight toward him, utterly overconfident, we thought. Helmeted still as we were, it was unmistakable that we were all glancing at each other as we followed him in perfect clocks here. Ulrich, the bastard. He walked straight toward the king and put out his hand. All on the deck held their breath. But without so much as a flicker of his eyelids, Mortarion nodded to his aid to bring them forward. Aghast, in utter shock, the Primarch himself handed the bubbling murky black drink to Ulrich. The gas was exquisite, of course. The draughts of death. And as the Pale King slung back his brew, to his surprise, so did Ulrich. Their arms both coming down from their faces, Ulrich's arm then went out to the aid again. His eyes locked on Mortarians. He seemed to be trying to stare him out. And then he just spat. Tastes like... More! The death shroud seemed to lurch a pace forward. A blade was even near drawn, many hands on hilts as they eyed Ulrich. 
The Pale King, our Lord and Master, just nodded, holding Ulrich's gaze. He nodded, extending his own glass without looking, and both were refilled. And both Ulrich and Mortarion raised a glass and drank again deeply. Ulrich seemed to sway for a mere millisecond as he lowered his glass from his lips. But then, to the intake of breath from all, he shot his arm out again. His voice was low, rasping, weak, but he spat again. More! At this, the Primarch took one step closer to Urk, towering over him. Yet he did not break his locked eyes. He did not smirk, nor nod, nor raise an eyebrow even. He just moved out his arm, and both glasses were filled again. He should have been dead from two, one even. But two of these lethal brews? It was his way. For the victor on the field to be honored with a concoction of poison so lethal that they would even affect the stamina of a Primarch eventually. Yet here was the third. Surely, a mere marine, even what such as Ulic, should be dead. The third draft was poured. But before they drank, the Primarch leant down, practically to the nose of Ulic. And he whispered, You are near death, Ulic. Vanity. And our sergeant, he whispered back, Nay. The king spoke to him again. Who is your lord? Ulic now drank. He bolted back the drink, the grass dropping from his hand as his left arm just fell. He could barely stand even now, even before the third draft had taken hold of him. And he said, You are. And only few could hear as the Primarch truly whispered. Not the crusade, humanity, or even the emperor. Ulrich craned his head and looked at him even deeper. No, I care not for any of that. You are my lord. So bloody use me. And the pale king rose. His mouth contained a wry twist at the corners. As close to a smile as any of us had ever witnessed. He now spoke loudly enough for every last person in the hangar to hear. Oh, rest assured, Ulrich, I shall use you. He spoke over his shoulder, still eyeballing the smaller man. Take this, my warrior, to the apothecary. To which the sergeant, damn him, barely even able to stand, he shook his head slowly then turned and started to walk. His back turned on the Primarch. Again, the hackles of the Death Shroud seemed up. Yet the Pale King raised a hand to stop them and stated, Let him walk, if he can. And if he wakes, then he shall arise a centurion. And if you wake, I will use you, Ulic. I will. Use you. As his squad, we followed him in lockstep again, and as soon as he made it out of the hangar, the very next step, he fell. We caught him before he hit the deck, and we put him on our shoulders as we walked him to the apothecary. And there we stayed, all of us. Days passed. It was touch and go. But he made it, and he took us with him. He was risen to Centurion, and we were to be his guard, all of us. And from there, well, that is a long tale indeed. A story stretching millennia. The date was set, the plans drawn, the die cast. And in the next few days, Tarax Antarax, the Cudgel, Hexamon, 
the Oathkeeper, and Ulick, the Unreasonable, were seen at the front. Practically under the noses of the Xenos defences, they would creep through the siege emplacements, going down through the tunnels and trenches. Each day, they took weapons of ancient design to within spitting distance of the walls, and each day, they would come back with their results. They had a mere three days to prepare for the event, but on the third morning, they had found their answer. As always, Tarax would pop his head over the trench edge and take one shot from his weapon of the day. He trusted none of his subordinates to do this. It was so very personal, because for the first time in a long time, Tarax was having fun. As he ducked down under cover again, the next face to come up would be that of Hexamon and some of his men. They would snipe out anyone firing down on Tarax's position with ruthless efficiency. Just outside of the automated defensive gun's range, only other snipers could possibly hit them. Yet the Emperor's children took at least one of the defenders, often more, whenever they popped their heads over. Such brutal accuracy that even an Imperial fist would nod in approval. And while this all went on, Ulick would pop up and fire his own weapon of choice. They would do this for a few rounds, repositioning, then firing, then ducking once more. And the harmony between them was a thing to behold. The drill masters would have shed a tear. Their upper officers looked on in horror. For this was the first time that any had witnessed these three men working with anyone else in such accord. And on that third day, they had an answer. They were followed by only a pair of their honor guard for speed of movement. As they met up on that third day, walking through the mud back to the HQ, they traded information. Ulick the unreasonable bit off. Are we there yet, Tarax? We better be. Tomorrow we attack, stated Hexamon, thumping Tarax on his shoulder pauldron in a totally uncharacteristic display of bonhomie. Tarax then threw back his head and laughed. Ha 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 Oh yeah. I have the measure of their defenses. I know what that shield does now. Ulick then barked. Then you know how to take it down. Good. We are on track. The three leered at each other. Their vile plan was about to be realized. It was winter. The target city was in the northern hemisphere, and the dusk was swift and complete. Like a dark satin cloth being dropped over the world, there was now total darkness. The defenders had long ago learnt that to use light was to invite the pinpoint accuracy of the Emperor's children, and the camp of the besieged marines was rigidly disciplined. No light shone to give away their positions. In fact, the defenders would never understand the depths of their danger. For the Iron Warriors had begun this siege. The alien defenders had powerful energy weaponry, fields as strong as void shields, protected anywhere of worth. The smaller the area protected, the more powerful the effect. Yet, the Xenos had lost three cities of smaller scale to the invading Iron Warriors in rapid succession. As stated, they had begun this siege, so everything was underground. Everything. Burrowing with the support of the Mechanicum, they had not even entered the valley, never showed themselves on the plains, had begun their tunnels on the other side of a range of hills. They were large, but not dense. Hence, the Iron Warriors had wormed their way across the plains, always digging lower on one side than that facing the citadel. 
They could all walk unobstructed and practically open on one side, utterly out of sight to their foes still. The enemy had only known they were present when they came out to scout. Trapdoors and hidden trenches, all dug out so as to not even appear to the defenders, as they were dug out from below. And the Xenos who came out far enough were dragged under, shot from below, or simply fell into trench works and were torn to pieces by the Astartes hidden there. The digging had continued, yet when they had reached a certain point, the Iron Warriors had thrown everything they had at the gates. They appeared out of hidden holes all across the valley, coming out in near total surprise on one terrible dawn. Yet, despite the surprise, the defences of the Xenos had held. Their automated turrets had activated and culled the sons of Perturabo before they had even taken a dozen paces. These turrets were soon shot out, but the defenders on the walls now shot down into the oncoming iron warriors and scythed through them. A direct assault was not possible. Not with the resources in place. So, the iron warriors had called for assistance. And it is to the seeming backwater, yet vitally important planet, that the three officers had been sent to resolve the issue. Tarax and Tarax had reviewed the doctrines in place, the strategy and tactics used thus far. He did not even finish his review before he summoned the officer in charge. The doors opened, and the officer walked in. The doors opened again, and his guards dragged out the now headless man. His cranium a messy pulp. The cudgel did not restrain himself when he knew that he was right. Offensive operations were instantly put on hold, the only activity being deeply unpleasant attacks during the night. Never full-on assaults, but rad grenade launchers, toxin gas assaults. The enemy would never make out those who attacked them. They would never understand how some of their people had died until it was an entire section. Yet still, Antarax did not order a full attack. His time with the Night Lords had certainly done its job. For the Xenost must have been quailing now. Not because they had suffered, but because they could never see or revenge themselves on said attackers. Ghosts. The defenders would believe they were fighting ghosts. Yet all of this was a ruse, of course. There would be a full-scale assault, but the cudgel never messed around. He only launched an assault for one of three reasons. One, to keep the enemy tired, bedraggled. For few beings had the stamina of an Astartes, so these battles of endurance were always one-sided. Two, to remove an annoying subordinate that had transferred from fleet. It was rare, but occasionally, some bright rising star would be fed to Antarax. And three, to end the matter in one hammer blow. One swing of the proverbial cudgel. And the first two were exceptional rarities. When Tarak struck, he dealt a coup de grace. He ended his enemy. Digging had continued, but something special had been agreed before he had even landed. The previous commander was not a total incompetent, it now seemed. Entire segments were for the siege ordinatus that upper command had requested. Tarax, Hexamon and Uluk were present when it was discovered. The three had grinned at each other when they had heard. Gaining ordinatus was practically unheard of in some areas, rarest of the rare as the crusade came out far enough. Their lines of supply stretched to near exhaustion and the regional forge worlds after recovering from being brought back into compliance. But, when one had them attached to your fleet, your section, it was far, far easier to keep them than gain them. The three had plans that made their use derelict, yet the opportunity was all. 
and both Ulick and Hexaman had thrown aside their claim. Strangely, the three had been utterly candid with each other, something most despised them for, if truth be told. But when these men spoke more and more openly as they mingled, they found true kinship. In such a short time, they were even finishing each other's sentences when pauses permitted, if not outright invited this. And in that room, when they first met, they recognized something. They had absolutely zero competition with one another. And from that day, their discussions had been incredible, harmonic. For Hexamon was a drop specialist, Ulick an all-rounder. Neither needed the Ordinatus, the heaviest bombardment cannons the Imperium commanded. But usually, a marine officer could be guilty of greed in only one situation. War gear. When it was offered, available, none turned it down. Many harbored it just for its utility. So most would have at least tried to gain a slither for their own forces, but not this time. They would give it all to Tarax. And when Hexamon declared what he required from the campaign, the other two men nodded in appreciation. Of something worthy of having, yet something they would never acquire nor want, yet still honored the wish. Ulick had his goals also, but again, neither of his allies balked. In fact, they agreed to most things and that terrified all around them. Their respect was mirrored, the dark as night humor exchanged. A woe for the galaxy and its future became stronger with every second they were together. Ulick had chosen his line breacher squads to take the first wave, for if anyone could weather the initial defensive fire, it was the Death Guard and Ulick would be right behind the prime squads, the forlorn hope, the first to rise from the trenches and make the mad dash towards any hole in the walls. He prepared his breacher squads, as they would be best placed to take the frontal charge, nor would any of them refuse the honor. Many would see it as a chance at glory. Others would see it as a chance to be free of their terrible burden, it was not pleasant being a breacher under the command of the unreasonable one. Yet, as unreasonable as he was, he could, at times, be fair. Harsh, but fair. If they survived, they would be transferred to another unit, another role. Ulick rotated his men regularly. Some said to give them false hope, but this was Gallo's humor more often than not. They were Death Guard. They endured as well as the Iron Warriors. And high above, Hexamon had now transferred back up to his strike cruiser. The drop pod assault would fall fast. But all was now in place. All was ready. For Tarax and Tarax had found the type of field protecting the city the makeup of the nut, so he had exactly the right nut cracker in place. When dusk finally swept down, it began. Ulick and Tarak stood together in a trench, all at their order. They both looked at their chronometric readings on their heads-up displays, nodded to one another, then barked the same simple order. Begin! Hidden trapdoors swung down, and hundreds of marines charged up them onto the muddy ground toward the walls. Tarax now watched his display as he saw the same information being fed to Ulick. The Death Guard were pushing forward, but many of the chevrons were disappearing, becoming dormant as their corresponding marine lived no more. The casualties were easily half of that which had been offered up in the Iron Warrior's assault before the Trinity had taken over. Breacher shields held high, 
The defenders had to concentrate rapid fire down on one until they simply burnt from being superheated. They were dying, but they were getting closer. So much so that they had overshot expectations. Tyrax then chuckled as he looked at Ulrich and said, Some of your men are now in the way. A snort issued from Ulrich as he spat. My men are here, behind and around me, indicating his honor guard. Those are just names on a casualty report. Statistics. <laughs> Let her rip. And all could hear the tension in his lips, how they must now be twisting into a smile. <laughs> Echoed Tarax, as he then gave the one sigil order to fire and said quietly, There she blows. The bodies will give power to the shot. With that, a light came streaking across the skies. From an impossible distance, calculated perfectly. It had followed the curve of the planet itself, and it slammed into the region like a spear of sunlight. A heavy conversion beamer. Yet when it hit the walls, it ate everything before it, everything out in no man's land for a dozen paces on either side of its progress, including the marines over which it sailed so seemingly high above their heads. For the blast was actually a field of power that converted all before it, all that it struck, antimatter. And as it passed over the marines it gained in power. It slammed into the walls of the Xenos city. It did not smash them or blast them. It changed them into energy. The wake of the weapon simply unmade everything before it. Then, at its most powerful, it struck the wall fully, eating the exterior, absorbing the shield, adding to its power, until finally it then gave a secondary explosive sound as all of the accumulated and converted matter now erupted forward as the field was broken, finally having changed all that it could. And the power therein contained smashed down the walls of the citadel like they were made of sugar or salt. Where any other attack had been absorbed into the shields of the enemy, this weapon had converted the force fields into power and turned it on its users. These weapons were rare, even during the Crusade, so Antarax had to be sure before deploying them. But in the game of rock, paper, scissors, this had been the paper to the defense's rock. And there was now a gap in the curtain wall, twenty paces wide. The Death Guard shifted their charge and accumulated at the open segment and went in hard. Their breacher shields protecting them from much of the enemy fire, but not all. Many died, but still fewer than there should have been. The Death Guard simply moved forward, shugging off hits that would have floored or outright slain other Marines. And amongst the breacher front lines soon appeared the destroyer units, backing them up. The breachers locked their shields as they now advanced into the alien city, covering for the oncoming destroyers. Behind them was Ulrich and his honor guard, and right behind them were the Iron Warriors headed by Tarax and Tarax. And it went like clockwork. Ulrich, taking his men into the city, pushing forward endlessly, taking fire and attention wherever they could. All while Tarax and Tarax led his men in one hard push toward a building that seemed to be only moderately defended. Yet, it was strategically important. Very for Tarax had studied the Xenos, had discussed them with Hexamon as well, and both were now almost certain that they knew the best way to take down the Xenos power grid in a very specific region, with the destruction of just one building. Hence Tarax and his men came to it, then set up heavy weapons, 
and brought this innocuous fortification down in just three volleys. It was not just the power of the melters and last cannons that they had brought, the many crack missiles that soared through the air. It was the accuracy as well, the precision. Not the impossible shots of the Emperor's children or the Imperial fists, but fire solutions made via experience. For the Iron Warriors knew one segment of war above near all others, how to take down fortifications, and they brought down the building in seconds, and not a moment too soon. For as it all came crashing down, the shielding over the city, that separate defence that protected them from above, a segment of it went down. Not everywhere, as was soon apparent, but in one tight section of only a hundred metres around. And in less than three seconds, the drop pods of the Emperor's children came through the hole in the grid, aiming directly at the centre spire of the defenders, their capital building. The men of both Death Guard and Iron Warriors marvelled. As the fire encased drop pods crashed through and smashed directly on target, purple clad marines charged out into the very centre of the spire, among the ruining cast of the Xenos. One of Tarax's men balked and just looked at him. What would be if we were only a few seconds late? And Tarax snorted. They would all be dead to a man. The level of trust for this little venture to work as it did was not lost on anyone who participated in it. The next hour found the enemy falling back again and again under the brutal trudge of the Death Guard and Iron Warriors. Yet the automatic turrets were all down. The city's only defence its lacklustre soldiers. They were armed well, but had no experience. Nor were they a match for the Astartes. So they died swiftly. Yet still, it took time to get to the central point. And when Ulic and Tarax finally took the last thoroughfares into the square before the Spire of Command, they witnessed the triumphant departure of Hexamon the Oathkeeper. He had made an oath of moment that he would take this position with only half a company of men, and in half the time it should, by the strictures of the Principia Bellicosa, and by all realistic projections. Yet, when Ulic and Tarax looked on as he slowly walked down the remains of the majestic stairs to this civilization's highest holy place, he had but a fraction of the men he took in. The losses were extreme, but the deed had been impossible. And yet, neither the Death Guard nor the Iron Warrior looked on in anything but cheerful acceptance. They had not doubted him for a minute, not a second. So unlikely a trio. Everything logical, every rule of the universe and the human condition stated that they should have despised one another. Yet now, together, they had pulled off a victory so swift, so total, that it could not be kept out of the annals of the legions. Somehow, the three had become greater than the sum of their parts. A combination, a cocktail, a realization that hundreds of marines and millions upon millions of mortal humans, almost without count, would come to deeply regret. It was only a few short years until they all met again, on the darkest day of the fledgling Imperium, in year 006, Millennium 31, when all was turned upside down in the Urgal Depression of Istavan V. Tears. It had been so long. Hexamon could barely remember the last time it had happened. They were running in canals down his face. He even slammed his fist into the desk to try to regain some control. But as he did so, yet another grey-armoured warrior 
exploded into a cascade of metal flakes that was now slowly falling down to the surface. As his bank of scorpion tanks fired, tearing apart the assault squads with ease, he laughed and laughed and laughed. Hexamon had not had so much fun in so very long. Hexamon the Oathkeeper was the captain of the Emperor's children, and not just any captain. He was known to most of his troops as one of the Triad, or the Triumvirate, is what some called them. Few above a certain rank cared, or even acknowledged what was going on. Fewer still really tracked this sort of thing anymore. For once the legions had been tight, disciplined, orderly. Nothing went unnoticed. All was ordered and regulated. Everything. Every last moment of every single day. But now, in many legions, the changes had come slowly. Not so in the Emperor's children. One month they were deemed one of the most professional, direct, and skilled of all the legions. Now, the damage to their structure alone had been terrifyingly swift. The rot had set in, is what many had commented. But this was not the truth. The rot, as one might put it, had been run toward and grasped with a hungry passion few will ever experience. For the Emperor's children had always been railing against their past, their cheated fate. So when the new wave of activity had come, the alteration, the enhancement, the mutilation of their near-perfect forms, most got on board not just willingly, but enthusiastically. And when it came to using these new abilities, they showed little to no restraint. But Hexamon had not done this. He had wanted to, but had resisted. He was saving himself for a better fate, a much grander metamorphosis. It was, of course, all thanks to his friend, Ulik, providing him with the materials he needed to be multiple steps ahead of his competitors. While others played with narcotics and enhancements, degenerating swiftly, Ulick had kept those around him in the know. How? Nobody knew. But he was always at least one step ahead of those around him, often many more. And Hexmon had been able to speak to Ulick like no other in his entire life. As equals and Ulick had given him books, scrolls, parchments, and data screeds aplenty. All of it entailed a discourse of a completely new source of power, a well of infinite potential that he could plumb at any time. The gifts of the Dark Gods. And Hexamon, like nearly all from his legion, had chosen Slanesh as his master, the Prince of Pleasure. Yet, he was so far ahead of his competition that Hexamon would be genuinely grateful to his friends. Gratitude. A strange thing for him to feel. He had always done everything himself, had never relied or trusted any. Not when he was a member of a squad that was supposed to be his family. Not even when he was fighting cheek to jowl with these men did he ever consider them his equal. They were footnotes in his memoirs. They were backdrop to his legend. Nothing more. Yet, in these two individuals, Tarax Antarax and Ulic the Unreasonable, he had found not just kindred souls, but lifelong friendship. And as Hexamon clenched his fist and slammed it down again and again on the table, his only thought was that he would have to save these moments to watch with them all, for he was witnessing what could only be described as a divinely inspired comedy. It was the tantalizing irony of it all. The Space Wolves had come out of nowhere, crashed into the fleets and brawled like berserkers. Tough fighting, as they were utterly illogical, 
things of pure rage. They were the flip side of the world eaters, some said. But in any case, for whatever reason, these warriors of Fenris were near impossible to beat. Or so many believed. They were the executioners of the Emperor himself, they claimed. And they had already crushed a thousand sons. Some said that they were responsible for the missing numbers in the legions, the second and eleventh. But if anyone knew the truth of the matter... It was the old man Malkador, the Emperor, and the Russ, and they alone. In any case, Hexamon never worried about the past. His eyes were firmly fixed on the future. He did not give one single fig for the prodigious battle honours or pedigree of his enemies beyond that required to destroy them utterly. And Hexamon had been offered a defensive posting one that seemed rather unobtrusive and unlikely to garner him any glory, nor entertainment. It was the proverbial short straw this time. Yet Hexmon had a strange feeling come over him when the posting was ratified. The sort of expectant glee one has before a much-anticipated event or day. And he knew his secret benefactor guided him in this way. He was not going to be bored. Yet something deeper came over him. A feeling of wanting to be ready. Like a host who knows not who will attend their party. What best nibbles and libations would meet needs and dazzle those who attended. Thus Hexamon went to the armory to prepare his hearth for visitors. He nodded to the tech marines as he entered waved them away when they looked like they would approach him, his hands clasped behind his back, whistling a jaunty ditty. Hexamon wandered the hallways, perusing, not choosing. It was when he came to a fleet of a dozen brand-new shiny tanks that he gasped. As if struck by the entry of a classic beauty into a room, he went starry-eyed, and something stirred within him. Joy. He looked at his heads-up display and instantly turned and moseyed back to the tech marines to check on the status of the tanks. They were operational, had only arrived before Istvan. They had hardly been used. Few saw their utility in this war thus far. And so, Hexamon had little difficulty commandeering them for his placement what a decision that turned out to be. And with every single missile that rose into the air, Hexmon whispered a secret thanks to the thing that had guided him to them. Because the Space Marines had struck at his out-of-the-way station. In their rush to attack the fleet of the War Master, they had scattered some secondary assaults in the region, more to draw away forces than anything else, Hexamon surmised. But it had worked all too well in many areas. The amount of walls that were used was small, but their skill was unsurpassed. When it came to killing other marines, there were few who could compare to the vaunted Volka Fenrika. Yet, when a strike cruiser had hove into view on his scopes, Hexamon had relished the opportunity. And he had arranged the defences so that it was clear that only a decapitation strike would do the trick. And thus, shown this very simple and effective way to close the encounter immediately, the wolves had taken it. But Hexamon epitomized the very tenets of the drop of salt. He knew them. They were carved all over his mind, his soul, his heart. Hence he knew how to defeat one. And his arrangement of fire, all of it holding off, until the space wolves were practically on top of them. But when the drop pods had reached a certain point, when they could not get away, could not change their course or divert, Hexamon had raised the void shields he had secretly placed around his central camp. The pods had then exploded on their shield, and the dropping jump pack troops were now coming into a situation they were not prepared to meet. 
for the pods were to have impacted, then opened, and around a hundred marines should have come out in the midst of his lines. Of course, this had not occurred. But why were these weapons so useful in this situation? For they were not anti-aerial systems. Simple. The wolves could not drop into the city due to the void shields. Hence, they were attempting to congregate on any outcrop or landing spot anywhere his defences were not eviscerating everything near them. And so Hexamon continued his unnatural laugh while pressing the orders to fire on regions that looked out of line of sight and devoid of defensive emplacements. The wolves would rue the day they dropped on Hexamon and his men. Oh yes, they would. And all the while, it was not lost on Hexamon that the wolves themselves had invented this particular weapon, or at the very least, they had demanded its creation. Oh, how they must have regretted that decision now. So much has happened. So much. In a few scant years, everything we knew was gone. All of the pillars of our world kicked over, and the palace had come crashing down. We were all members of the lodges now. Ulluk brought us all in as one, and we, his guard, we ruled there. Even Grulgor might nod to us inside, maybe, but he did not sneer. From being at the bottom of the pile, we were now tip of the top. We followed in his comet's trail, for Ulic's rise was now meteoric. I remember the day that we knew it, the final sign of being chosen. We had all been working on our armor, repairs, cleaning, stripping where we could, but most of it went to our tech marines or the Adepts of Mars. They were fine suits of warplate, but they had been with us since the death of the Xenos King and before. It was deemed an miracle, for not one of us had passed, not one of us had been slain, not one of us had been killed in action. We served the unreasonable one, and he kept us close. We fought, and we fought hard, but we did not get thrown into the thresher like most. That day, he simply marched in, stood at the door, and caught our eyes. One by one, he locked us in. He had a strangely magnetic power now. Authority and dignity. But there was always that threat. It exuded from him. He then simply nodded his head. We were to follow him. He led us to the cages, but when the doors opened, he sent us in first. We padded in at high alert, but then we smelt it, then we felt it, then we heard it. The smell unmistakable, freshly minted, oiled and pristine. There was no smell quite like it. For what some do not know is that when you are one with your plate, wear it for weeks at a time, combined over years. It's almost like your scent is indelibly printed on it and gaining makeshift repairs cannibalized from other suits. It has their smell, not yours. Not for some time. But eventually, the warplate collects a smell, almost impossible for baseline humans to discern. But I can smell it. And here was an experience I had not had in near a decade more. The odor of brand new plate. He walked in behind us and simply clapped and the illuminators went up. And there it was. We could feel the ripples of the vibrations from it, so much quieter than previously. The hum was amazing, so soft, like a purr. And it was pristine, it was sleek, 
It was racks of new war plate, one for each of us. With compliments of the pale king himself, beamed Ulrich. And we each poured at the plate in awe, and it was even better when worn. Lighter than Mark III, more protection than Mark II. Quieter than either. More large plates, it's true, yet also more actuators and joint movement. Enhanced power in the backpack. And we were before many of the veteran units to get ours. We wore them with pride. Yet again, Ulrich had provided. Yes, it came from the king, but he was why we all wore it now. Only three weeks later, it happened. The event we had all been secretly waiting for, and it was glorious, and it was terrible. It would be dubbed the Drop Site Massacre, and we were right in the thick of it. We were tasked by the Pale King himself as well. We watched on as he said to Ulrich, Go out and cause trouble. Three sips, Ulrich, as much as your heart desires. And oh, he did. We did. While the three initial legions came down, we crept forward into prearranged positions and laid in wait. We hit them as soon as a few squads had passed, right up out of concealed foxholes into the middle of them and we rent and shot and tore and slew. And it was our own kind we fought. For the first time ever, we killed marines. We went into the Iron Hands first, and the new plate was worth every second of it all, for we could outmaneuver Mark Threes, with a tiny touch faster and stronger than twos. And as we were already elite, these tiny fractions of seconds on our side, from our new servos, it told all of the difference. Between gods of war, in bolter and blade work, a millisecond may as well be a millennium. But it didn't end there. We could see the titans annihilating entire companies, the heavy fire coming down in carpets. And when the second wave came down, Ulig laughed. The rest of us involuntarily shrugged, but he chortled because they were really with us. <laughs> they were with us. Oh, how the loyalists cheered, thinking they were being reinforced. But their cries turned to wails when the second wave legions turned their guns on them. Having enough sport and not wanting to share a theatre with night lords and world eaters, we went to the west and hunted salamanders. And within two days, there was no more fight in any of them. And we now walked the mounds. While others caroused, celebrated or drank, we were out there on the depression. Ulek had us bring his pet apothecary, Meganel. We were executing those who had slipped into the torpor-like state where Astarte self-repair. We prevented that. But that was not the primary reason to be out there. Fulik had Manganel harvest gene seed. Like a river. And that is where we found him. An iron hand. His body shuddering, his head damaged. But around him... Oh, around him were a stack of world eaters. He had slain over a dozen of those drooling maniacs. It was easy to tell by the cuts the accuracy. It was all his work. And Ulrich looked down on the marine, and he had that glint in his eye. We brought him back, you see, this marine, this veteran. His blade and plate denoted him as a high officer. A hero of his company? <laughs> Not anymore. Manganel stabilized his condition, and Ulrich went to work on him. Days later, the three, as we called them, 
met again. Our Lord, Ulic of the Death Guard, Hexamon of the Emperor's Children, and Tarax Antrax of the Iron Warriors. They drank rare Amasek of a Xenos design. It raised their flushes. I was outside the doors, and they were in high spirits. Madaya listened. Now, I know you didn't want anything, Tarax, said Ulic. But I found him, and I couldn't resist. At this, the towering marine walks into the room. He is blank of eye, glaring at all but Ulic. But his armor is repaired. He wears the colors of the Iron Warriors now. Ulic continued. He's all yours. A guard who will never ever question your word, never be bribed, never betray. Soldier, he said, looking at this iron warrior. This is the man I spoke of, your new master. You will do all he says. You will be his shield. His life is yours. His death is yours. You will serve him and no other. No instruction given by any, even me, can now be a countermanded. This is your master for all time. Now, greet Tarax Antarax as you should. And he knelt and held up his sword for inspection. Tarax. I found him amidst a pile of world eaters. He knows his trade. He's a veteran par excellence. And he's all yours. Tarax and Tarax inspected the sword, then the marine. You've outdone yourself, my friend. I have to admit to having my reservations about some of my men. This will do nicely. And you're sure it's permanent? His conversion? To which Ulic responded, Oh, yeah. Arthas here is a few bots short of a full volley, but he's good at what he does, and he will never turn on you. I broke him, then I remade him. Well, after a few alterations. Ulic then passes Tarax and Tarax a box. <laughs> of course. We all know what's inside. Brain, matter. Not too much, but enough. A memento. And all three of them laughed. What do you call him? Said Tags. Oh, he is Ossus, the Unmaker. Ulic then turned to the captain of the Emperor's children. An Hexamon. Your Kato seed is prepared as agreed. The bounty was rich, my brother. It was rich. And now, in our terms, so are you. Rich in seed. Nothing better, said Hexamon. Tarax then stated, I feel this little war is going to be good for us if we stick together. And all three... Lead. To be continued.